thank you so much, Pastor Pete, for inviting me. I, I do recognize a few people, uh, Ron and Sherry, and uh, we've worshiped together before uh, while I was living in Madison. So it's exciting to be able to speak with you this morning. I'm really familiar with Madison. My wife and I lived there for 20 years. Um, before that, we were missionaries in Turkey and Africa and various places. Um, came to Madison originally uh, as a church planting pastor of a church restart in downtown Madison and really um, had developed, I don't think I developed, but just lived out a compassion for the poor and for the lost and uh, met Sherry Oliver actually on the streets uh, down there, uh, handing out sandwiches to homeless people and devil worshipers and the down and outers and the outcasts. Um, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun um, just sharing the love of Jesus, um, building community, a, a real kingdom community that um, in various places, uh, times seemed to find its way back into the church uh, at times. But I remember uh, a, a time where God really um, we were noticing that people were giving their lives to Jesus, and we were so excited, um, but then they seemed to just go missing, and then we would find out that they had a relapse or something like that, and so when you're dealing with people with that are really coming from the depths of addiction and trauma and rejection, um, you know, their, their starting point is very different than somebody who grew up in a stable home uh, with a stable mom and dad. We all need Jesus equally, um, but the way that um, sin and destruction surfaces can be a, a lot more aggressive, it seems like, when you're coming from really broken uh, backgrounds. And I remember God speaking to me and saying, uh, you're offering them a service to attend, and I want them to have a family to belong to. And it really challenged me um, to the core. And this kind of went along at the same time with uh, me really seeking, uh, coming back from Turkey, I made a vow to God. I, I believed uh, for a long time that the gifts of the spirit that we read in the book of, uh, of the Acts and through the New Testament were real. But um, I came uh, to know Christ and was raised by a pack of Baptists <laughs> out in the wild. I was picked up uh, by a pack of Baptists and, you know, they gave me a heart for the word and a heart for evangelism and a, a sense of discipline. But the word led me to the gifts of the spirit. But uh, it only led me so far because I had also a lot of of uh, skepticism and a lack of experience um, uh, when it came to those things. And I came back from Turkey with uh, a promise to God and kind of a vow and just said, God, I'm tired of just having Paul's theology of the Holy Spirit. I need the power. I need the reality. And if I need to be around weird people to figure this out, I'm willing, right? I was willing to swallow my pride and and to wander into the maze of what I call still affectionately charismania. Um, because as you know, uh, not all that is styled as the Holy Spirit is authentic. It's, it can be hype. It can be lights, camera, action. Um, but praise God, there is reality um, to be discovered. Um, and the word of God that was given to us by the Holy Spirit bears witness uh, and is a sure guide into what is real and what's authentic. And so I like to tell people in the church, you kind of see polar extremes. You see on one end, people who believe that any spiritual supernatural manifestation uh, is of the devil and to be shunned. And then others that honestly are so open to any kind of spiritual manifestation that there's no discernment as to the source whatsoever. Um, but I like to look at it this way, is that the Holy Spirit was not given to us um, to keep our services from being boring, uh, but the Holy Spirit was given to us to empower us to manifest Jesus in all of his character, in all of his compassion, in all of his power. So when you center 
the real, um, how the spirit operates and the purpose on the person of Jesus. Now we're talking and you line that up with the word um, as a whole. And, and now you've got something. And so you don't toss your Bible aside, um, but neither do you substitute the Bible for the living reality of the Lord God uh, that it that it uh, that wrote it. Um, you don't. Nobody goes into a restaurant um, and licks the menu. You read the menu to to order the reality and to taste and see the goodness of God that is described on the menu. Um, and so uh, that's basically my heart. So part of what God has really had us refocus on, we've kind of gone full circle to where we're kind of back to the simple uh, of, of, of being missionaries really in America. Um, I think, you know, we kind of find ourselves at a starting point with the way that church looks um, and the way that church functions. You know, they all have a building, they all got a pastor, they all got pulpits and they got a worship team. Um, and everybody's kind of tweaking that. But at the essence, our, our call is not to go and to multiply congregations. We, you have to drill down a little bit further. We have a commission from Jesus to make disciples. Um, and that was a very simple thing. And sometimes church is very complicated. You know, church requires a budget and a 501c3 and a seminary trained pastor and all this kind of stuff. And if we're not careful, the average believer ends up investing all of their time and energy um, trying to support the this bigger thing the, 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 that they identify as the church without recognizing their own personal um, ministry calling, their own ministry um, this, um, in something that's larger than merely volunteering on a campus to support the organization um, by fulfilling roles in committees or functioning in their gift, so to speak. Um, we each one have been commanded by Jesus Christ to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, that uh, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. But if you keep reading, everyone who's a new creation is also a minister of reconciliation, an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And those all go together. He makes us new on the inside, gives us the authority and a mission, a mission of compassion, a mission uh, that has the message of reconciliation. Um, and so wherever we go, we are ambassadors of the kingdom. And so it's been kind of an interesting journey for me that I feel like God has called me to, um, to really help the church. And this is, was my conference and my conference ministry is really helping the church to be the church off campus <laughs> outside of the church walls. Right. And I think that's every pastor's job. That's every pastor's vision and heart. And I, I really appreciate and affirm, um, you know, pastor Pete and, and Allie, we've, we've had some good fellowship and I sense a real camaraderie in the spirit. So don't hear me um, criticizing anything as much as we kind of come at things from different angles. You sort of need somebody coming in from the outside from time to time to help spur things along uh, because the pastor by necessity looks at things from the inside out and has to think from the center of the congregation uh, and consider all the possibilities. And, and it's kind of nice to have somebody come in from the outside and just say, it's about the mission and it's about Jesus. It is not about you people and how you feel. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like uh, as soon as you join the military, they don't care whether you're an introvert. They don't care if your feet hurt. They don't care if you like your hairstyle or not. They don't care if you, how you look in the uniform. We have a mission to do. We have training that um, needs to be done. And it's important that we can say, to to ground our lives and say king jesus is worthy he is worthy of all praise all honor all glory he has all authority in heaven and on earth and he deserves 
all of my obedience. He deserves all of my love, and he is worthy of, of, of being praised by every single person on the face of this planet. He deserves to be known as he really is, not as uh, their false impressions from maybe televangelists or their legalistic uh, grandmother or the church that they grew up in. They des- Every person should hear about Jesus, but also see Jesus on display through his body. And that's what we are. We are his containers. We are the reincarnation, so to speak, of Jesus Christ. He now has a larger body than just the the man of Nazareth that uh, died on the cross and raised from the dead and is seated on the throne. He's poured out his spirit into us to fill us so that he can be himself inside of you and inside of me. He loves our personalities. He loves our backgrounds. But in his mind, none of that is any hindrance to him manifesting himself in fullness through your life. And so any place where we sort of discount, oh, that's Jesus, I'm an introvert, or oh, that's Jesus, but I had this background, or wait a second, Jesus is Lord, we have been crucified with Christ, uh, and it's no longer us who lives, we've been gotten out of the way by the cross, and so we need to get ourselves out of our own way in our own mind, and as far as God is concerned, we're not a problem anymore. He dealt with that. (laughs) And so all of your things that you're carrying around and limping along with and using as an excuse, my encouragement is to you is to once again, don't only see Jesus dying on the cross for you to go to heaven, but Jesus dying on the cross as you, that when he died, you died in him. His death gathered you up and crucified everything that wasn't of God in your life. And so now sin, the devil, trauma has nothing to do with you and God. The cross resolves it. And now the spirit of God lives inside of you. And when we live by that faith and let that truly take uh, occupancy in our hearts, in our minds and grow in that, that we begin to live in Jesus in the presence of the Father, we wear our Jesus suit and we get to stand under the waterfall of the Father's love and drink deeply of the love that he's been sharing with his son for all eternity. And Jesus gets to wear his Andy suit and his Pete suit and his Alley suit because it's no longer us, but he dwells in our minds. He dwells in our hearts. We are his body. So where we go, He walks in us, he talks in us, and he can encounter the world in us. One of the things, so that's kind of foundational. What what I'd really like to talk about this morning um, is some things that I've been learning uh, because as we've come down here to Tennessee, you know, we've started brand new from scratch. We left a lot of 20-year relationships, and we're spending a lot of time building new relationships, both in the body of Christ uh, with believers to help disciple them, but also building relationships with unbelievers um, to share Jesus with them, but really to make disciples with them. Uh, And so it's been interesting. Allie, uh, before we left, she prophesied. She felt that the Lord was showing her that Um, He was going to be revitalizing Luke, uh, the gospel of Luke in my life. And uh, and he really has. I've I've spent a season just kind of going through Luke again. And here's a couple of things that I would say I've I've I'm sort of rediscovering, but, you know, not it's not new, but it's like rediscovering and fresh for me that I think will be encouraging to you. One of the things that's been very helpful for me is to realize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these big, you know, long 20 chapter books are called the gospel. So in the New Testament, the mind of the Holy Spirit is not looking at the gospel as a plan of salvation to be 
um, subscribe to. But as the person of Jesus Christ and all that he's accomplished and taught, right? So the good news begins at his birth that fulfilled all of these promises that were done ahead of time. Uh, and that it's the manifestation of God on the face of this planet and true humanity, the Son of God, Son of Man. It's all that he taught. It's how he dealt with religion. It's how he dealt with um, uh, with uh, government powers. It's how he dealt with the poor and women and uh, religious seekers and hardened religious hearts. It's how he dealt with the outcasts and the blue-collar workers and all of this, he because he brings in the kingdom. So the gospel is, uh, there's, I think we are influenced heavily by a mindset of let's, let's summarize the gospel so that Jesus gets his fair share, but ultimately it's a plan of salvation. But I believe, actually, we would do well to take a step back and say the gospel isn't a plan to be adhered to so that we pray a prayer and go to heaven, but a person to follow, a person to follow who actually calls us, don't, whatever way you're living, follow me, repent, I will lead you into the Father. No other way to get there. And I'm not here to try to necessarily get you to heaven by praying a prayer. Follow me. I will lead you into the kingdom. I will lead you into the Father. I will give you eternal life. I will give you forgiveness. But it's a person to follow. And so one of the things that's been kind of neat is thinking of it in terms of slow ev fast evangelism versus slow evangelism. Fast evangelism is just trying to have a quick encounter so that you can present a plan. But Jesus calls us not to make converts who go to heaven, but to make disciples. That means to multiply people who uh, uh, follow him, right? And so it's been interesting to look at how that plays out in Jesus's personal ministry and how he trained other people. Because what I see here, I just want to share with you because it's fresh for me. It's encouraging. It's taken some pressure off of me because now I am not trying to, to get a conversation to a point so that I can present a memorized um, gospel presentation. I'm actually interacting with people in such a way that I'm having, I'm building authentic relationship to um, the point that I can have authentic spiritual conversation um, so that uh, I can invite them to discover God for themselves through the scripture. And now I don't have to be the teacher. We read the Bible together and I ask them questions and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God just totally transformed their life. So now I don't have to be an amazing arguer or a great communicator. Let's just open the Bible, read a little bit, talk a little bit. And if you need to, you can pare it down to some key passages, right, that are going to help people uh, discover the key points of who Jesus are is. So I call that discovery Bible study. So my mindset has been, you know, and here's the thing that was interesting is I realized that I've been skimming across the surface of our culture for a long time and wondering why I'm not making a deep impact in the lives of people because I was using the gospel almost as the, you know, here, let me, let me sow my seed and share the gospel. But the gospel was a, was not uh, a uh, what was basically a plan of salvation, right? Uh, that has has no context in a lot of people's lives. Uh, and so I was starting the elevator at about the third floor, <laughs> so to speak. I wasn't bringing it all the way down to the lobby. So I want to just kind of bring out a few things from uh, Luke chapter 10, especially 
that uh, have been neat uh, and that I think will encourage you because I think a lot of people who think of evangelism and kingdom ministry think, oh, that's not me. I'm an introvert or I'm not a salesman, right? And I think the world would actually appreciate the body of Christ stop being salesmen for Jesus <laughs> and start being real people who know how to have uh, authentic relationships that communicate like what first Peter says with gentleness and respect where people feel respected in your interaction with them. Right. Uh, and so we need to maybe take a step back. And so uh, I want to encourage you um, don't discount this message for you. If you're somebody who has kind of said, well, that's not my gift. I'm a worshiper. Or I'm an intercessor or I'm retired. You know what? The command, go make disciples, is for you and for me. Amen? Jesus said if uh, in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. So the, the mission of the gospel, of spreading the gospel, is not something we can contract out to the clergyman. You know, your, your, your money in the offering plate does not excuse you from gathering with Jesus. Amen. Uh, and, and we need to just own that and say, okay. And most people haven't been particularly good at this or particularly obedient to this, but I want to try to, rather than it come across as pressure, we just need to at least say, yes, Lord, I want to obey. I've not been good, but the, the yes is in my spirit. The yes is in my heart. And so if Andy can help me uh, to do this, um, I want to receive that, right? Okay, so a couple of things that we see in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Now it's interesting, Luke chapter 10 comes after Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, he sent the two out, he sent the 12 out two by two, Luke chapter 9 comes after Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now Jesus was going from village to village, healing the sick, casting out demons, and proclaiming the kingdom, and the 12 were with him, right? So Jesus was modeling community on mission, community on mission. And, uh, and so they learned by being with Jesus. They, they learned from his confidence. They learned by just being with him. But they were a community on mission. And so one of the things that, that I would encourage you is even if you can't find a whole team of people and don't wait for the church to create a program, you're the program. <laughs> you, people, individuals your commission and you know just having a pair a partner someone that you can say hey let's obey jesus together but we do it better by staying connected amen uh we we really do that better and one of the things that's been neat here is is god has connected me ali prayed before we left just God connect them with their tribe. Well, we prayed into that. We felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit when she prayed that. And God has connected us with some believers that really are very like-minded with us and have, uh, it's been fun to connect. And so one of the things that they were doing before I got down here was that they were spending Wednesday night at a hookah bar not hooker, hookah. Hookah is like a certain kind of Middle Eastern pipe. It looks like a, a lamp with uh, tubes coming out of it. Um, and the reason was is because that is a uh, uh, the sort of bar where people go to have conversations, almost like a coffee bar. Yes, they do serve alcohol there. Yes, they people do smoke. But that's what people that's what lost people do, right? Uh, and what was interesting is that they were going there as a group and probably about anywhere from three to five of them. Um, and they were just fellowshipping and, and making friends. And what was interesting is they invited me say, hey, you should come. I said, all right, sure, I'll come. And, uh, you know, I went 
And sure enough, you know, I started uh, interaction with somebody there and he's like, you guys really love each other. I've never seen that before. And I had a chance just to share some of what God was doing in my life. I asked him a lot about his story. He shared for about 45 minutes. And uh, then I shared a little bit of my story for about five minutes or so. And then he said, so what church do you go to? I said, actually, for me, this is kind of church right now. <laughs> you know, like we're, we've got a group of people that we do family together, God's family. Um, and, you know, we, we care for one another. We share with one another. And he goes, man, I would love to have that. And I said, you've got it. Come on in, <laughs> you know. Um, just And so a number of people have made the comment that, they're, they observe the way we relate to one another. When you are light, man, the darkness recognizes. Even when we were in, uh, when we were in Madison, one of my buddies, Wade, um, he was trying to raise money for a mission that he was going on. And so he had a game night. But he also decided to go ahead and invite some people from his workplace that he knew weren't believers. So it was kind of neat to get the believers and unbelievers together just for a game night. Imagine it not happening because it was a fundraiser. Imagine it just happening because, hey, you're getting your friends in, uh, from church together. And you know what? He said they came back to him and said, we've always wanted what you have. You have real community and we don't have that. They didn't believe a thing that he believed when it came to Jesus, but they were jealous of the community that the gospel, had. and we just played games together. I think I lost, you know, <laughs> I wasn't even any good. Uh, so one of the other things that we've done, we started a, a, a volleyball team and we're part of a bar volleyball league. Now, I, I'm just saying this a couple of things. One is that community is, is one aspect, but it doesn't have to take everybody. Just get a partner, right? Find somebody that your schedule, your heart can align with. Sherry and I partnered down on uh, State Street and she's partnered with, I think, half the city at various points because she's just been so um, faithful to, to be out with people and to say, hey, come with me, right? Um, and so if you're somebody who feels confident, look around. Who can you bring with you, right? Hey, come with me. You don't have to do it alone. Maybe this is something that's already in your heart. Uh, maybe this is new for you. Listen, it does. I'm, and I'm not encouraging someone to go to a bar, especially if you have, you know, addiction issues in your past. It's not a good idea. Um, but if you do, you certainly should have somebody with you. Amen. Um, but if you have addiction issues in your past, you might actually do better somewhere else. Like, you know, find a hiking uh, club or find a gardening club or a knitting club or a chess club. That, don't tell me you can't be an influence for Jesus because you're an introvert. Nerds need Jesus too. Amen. Go find a chess club or a book club or something really outlandish like a Star Wars fan club or something goofy like that, you know, because Jesus can shine his light everywhere. Um, so those are just some creative ideas that, that oftentimes we're waiting for the church to reach the community. And very early on in my time in Madison, I met with a man, some of you may know him, Sam Durham, and I met with him and I asked him, I said, so what is the Holy Spirit shown you about uh, Madison and his plans for Madison and, and revival, et cetera? And he said something that made a big impression on me, and I think it still holds true today. And he said, Andy, God has shown me this, that the church is, uh, Madison will not be reached by the church. Madison will only be reached by believers going out from the church to them. And I believe that that remains to be true because, you know, uh, there, people are not interested very much in a relationship with an institution or an organization. But that does not mean that they are not interested in a relationship with God or with other people who will sincerely care and love and respect them, right? And so the question then, uh, you know, one guy that I uh, read a book of his recently, 
um, he actually, part of his conference ministry, now I don't do it this way, um, he does some teaching. And then at one night, he says, okay, who wants to go to the bars with me? And nobody raises their hands. And <laughs> at one point, he was sharing his, his uh, interaction based on that. And he said, okay, so how many of you would be really excited if people in the bars tonight came to church tomorrow and everybody's hands went up right and then he said this he said well if they're going to come who needs to make the first move right it's a fair question oftentimes we're we're uh hoping that the church will come uh, but in luke chapter 2 uh luke, luke chapter 10 verse 3 jesus says go Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, right? So um, one thing that we need to understand is that sheep in the midst of wolves, it means Jesus is commanding us to get out of our comfort zone, to go be around people with totally different appetites than us um, that he knows are not going to necessarily treat us nice and be friendly. Uh, they're not going to have the same mindsets. But he says, I know what I'm doing. Yes, go, get, 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 get out, go, right? He's sending us out. And so partly we need to realize that that is Jesus's command. We've got to leave, leave our comfort zone. Now, this is the challenge for the church is that oftentimes, to be honest with you, we are, um, we've become a comfort zone to ourselves and we have a difficult time leaving the comfort of people who are supportive, who love Jesus. And that's why I think it's so strategic. Hey, we don't have to leave that. Get your best friend from church, go find some ways that you can interact with lost people. Okay, go. But I would say even before the go, what does he say? He says in, in, in 10 2, he says, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It all starts with prayer. It all starts with prayer. We have to be um, close to the heart of God. And we need to pray, not just that God would send other people out as workers into the harvest, but that when we pray that, that we're willing to receive God's vision and God's heart. You know, brothers and sisters, a harvest to a farmer is precious. It's valuable. Amen. Everything that that the farmer has done up to that point hinges on the harvest. His whole life is in that harvest. Here's the other thing that's cool. Resources are in the harvest. Amen. I mean, my my children are going to go to uh, go to school with new clothes because of the harvest, so to speak. And I'm not talking about just financial resources. Um, the key people that are going to reach Madison aren't even believers yet. The best evangelists are the best pastors, the best disciple makers don't even know Jesus yet. And so going to them, we need to have a vision that, you know, this is the Lord's harvest. Part of the other thing that, that this kind of prayer does is it gets us out of this mindset between secular and sacred. Um, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, be careful, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And one of the things that the world has tried to do is basically tell the church, hey, you guys are religious, do your Jesus thing on Sunday mornings in that building over there. Stay in the cage that we put you. But Jesus says, no, the world belongs to God. He is the Lord of the harvest. Everywhere I go, Jesus is Lord. Every person I see is precious to the Father. And we need to see the world this way because quite honestly, if we're not careful, we get this defensive reaction and say, okay, you know, y'all are wolves. Yeah, I know they're, they're you know, Jesus, the next verse says you're sheep among wolves. But guess what? That just means you're out of your comfort zone. They're still the harvest. They're precious. They're valuable to God. Amen. Uh, so it's so important that we go with a vision of God's value for the people that we see. They're not our enemies. If they're, they may be captive, 
Um, but we need to go with compassion, with value, with vision, and recognizing, you know what? Going is half the battle. I mean, you know, even if even if you are terrible as a worker, it's not about your gifts. It's about the harvest. Amen. <laughs> just just going is obedience. Uh, Jesus said, "If you love me, you'll obey me." Right. So it's about loving Jesus uh, primarily. And so there's yeah, there's days where it seems like nothing really goes well. It doesn't seem like you're making a whole lot of progress. Listen, don't be motivated primarily by results. It, be motivated by love for Jesus. This is worship. I'm going out for my king because he is worthy. The lamb is worthy to receive the obedience of all nations in the worship of all people. Um, and, and, and so I tell myself and I tell and I remind myself over and over when I start worrying about, you know, what if they get offended? What are people going to think about me? Blah, blah, blah. A few things that I remind myself, okay, this might help you. In Galatians, it says there's no law against love. Amen? So just go love your brains out. You, there, you can't go wrong. Amen? Just love people. Let it all hang out. It's about loving the people in front of you with the love of Jesus Christ. Treat people like they're worth dying for. That will, that will help you to tap in to Jesus's heart for people because this person who's broken or this person who's nasty or this person who's uh, argumentative is worth dying for on their worst day. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, right? But you know who they are. You know uh, what God has created them to be. So that's really important. Um, the other thing that I just remind myself is, Jesus, you're worth it. And so are they. And it gets me out of the way of, you know, like, what if I pray and they don't get healed? Or what if I talk to them and they say, buzz off? You know, who cares? It's not about what people think about me. It's about what God thinks about me. Amen. So I'm not going into people's lives hoping for an extra stroke of emotional affirmation. I'm moving into people's lives because I know who God says they are, and, and no matter how they treat me, Jesus is worthy, and so are they. Amen? Um, and, and that really takes some of the pressure off, honestly, but I'm going to actually take even more pressure off of you guys because I want you to see how amazing it is how Jesus sent us out. Um, he says, verse 4, carry no money bag, no shoes, greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Here's the cool thing about it. Your first ministry is just meeting people. That's it. Just meet people. Just meet them, right? You, you don't, you, and your life may not be together. You may not have any extra money. You may not have any extra clothes. You, you know, who cares? You got Jesus, you got enough. And so that lie that we need more money to do ministry, we need, you know, this or that, all you need is Jesus and an obedient heart. Uh, and so you can, you can take the kingdom to amazing places. Here's the cool thing about it, uh, is that he, he calls us not only to make converts, so it, but he calls us to make disciples. And so his process we may start off as outsiders in some people's lives. Now, listen, if, you're, if you've got people, friends, and family around you who don't know Jesus, you should start blessing them. You know, I, I just released, you know, it's, right, the peace of God, you know, so find things that you can bless in their life, you know, pray, let them know, hey, I'm praying for you, or hey, you know, I see God doing amazing things in you, or hey, that was awesome right? Speak, help them to, to uh, communicate love and communicate value. Uh, speak to them from the heart of God. Remember how Jesus interacted with Nathaniel? Man, there's an Israelite who shoots straight. No guile with this guy, right? He didn't even say God. He just said, you are a straight shooter. People can trust you because you don't, you don't, you don't manipulate the truth. And Nathaniel's like, how do you know me, right? It opened the door for, for more conversation. The woman at the well, remember? 
Jesus looked at her and was like, man, she's probably not going to want to talk to me, but I'm supposed to talk to her. So what did he do with her? He didn't start off by saying, woman, you've gone through a string of husbands and now you're living with somebody. He didn't start off there. He didn't. He started off with, hey, could you give me something to drink? Amen. So he just started the conversation, sometimes just breaking through the barrier to interact with people is all you need to do is you start there. So one of the things that's really helped me is, is, is to learn the things that need to happen that we need to get good at before we ever open our mouths to say anything about Jesus, we enter into people's lives. How good are we at building authentic relationships with people? Not because we're there to convert them, but because we care. We see value in them. Whether they're ever converted, and they will smell it a mile away if, if you're there to convert them, right? It's not about you converting them so that they, they believe what you believe. It's about because you see what you see, you have to love them. They have value if they never see it. Amen. How many people did Jesus heal that may never have followed him completely? Why did he heal them? Not with a string attached. Remember, he healed 10 lepers, only one returned to give thanks. He wanted the relationship from the other ones, but he didn't say, well, forget that. Take your leprosy back. No, there was no strings attached. He was happy to heal them. He was disappointed that it didn't go further because he wants, uh, he wants their hearts, right? So it, there's this kind of tension between caring for what's best and most necessary for people. Obviously, if you care about people, it means you want them to know Jesus. You want them to respond to the gospel. But that's not the only reason you're doing anything. You don't have this. They're not a project, right? They're a person. And if you meet Jesus and these people never came to know Christ, you will still be happy that you love them. And Jesus will reward you for all of the love you poured out. Amen. So we don't look to people and their response as our reward. We're pouring it all out at the feet of Jesus. So that's really exciting. So if you bless them and you encourage them and they're like, buzz off, you manipulative little blah, blah, blah. Guess what? They just blessed you because everything you just released to them comes back to you. You just get stronger and stronger. Like you can't lose. You cannot lose at this. Sometimes people put so much pressure on themselves. Like, what if I say it wrong? What if they don't believe? What if they ask me a question? I don't know. Who cares? Just get out there, love people and love Jesus uh, and do the best you can and you'll grow as you go. Okay. And Pastor Pete will help you. <laughs> you know, you come to him and say, Hey, I had this interaction. I didn't know what to say. Guess what? Pastor Pete, he loves to help people with that stuff. We that's what we live for. It's our calling to equip the saints, right? Um, so uh go get out of your comfort zones, but go in community. Uh, here's a few things that have helped me to enter into people's lives. One is um, begin to notice. Ask God to help you to notice the people around you or even open doors. Sometimes it's as simple as, I really like that necklace. Now you've started a conversation. and But don't put all this pressure on yourself like every conversation has to go to the cross. Good grief. You know, no wonder you don't talk to anybody. Uh, because you've got all this pressure on yourself that everything has to go, you know, it's got this huge agenda attached to it. Relax, learn to notice people around you. Um, and some of you, you'll, you'll notice things they wear, things they're doing. You'll notice their countenance. Um, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. Really? You look a little sad. Is something bothering you? begin to notice and to step towards those things that you notice. They almost, to me, feel like a word of wisdom sometimes, you know, like I'm walking around and I'm, I'm just like, Lord, I'm available. And then I see something or somebody does or hear something somebody says or um, notice something somebody has on. 
And it's immediately, oh, I, I can interact with them about that. I can talk to them about that. There's an open door for me to start a conversation. Um, and so get good at noticing people. Um, if nothing else, just to pray for them at first, take some pressure off of yourself, but just God help me, you know, if you're really introverted, just take some pressure off yourself. Lord, help me to notice people. Help me to see where I could engage a stranger in a conversation or say something um, if, if I wanted to, right? And get really good at noticing people. And then after a while, begin to open your mouth a little bit. Just, just do the thing that God shows you. Let him equip you in your imagination, right? So you can see the vision of how Jesus wants to flow through you. No condemnation here. Just start where you are. Let Jesus show you things um, in your heart, in your mind, through prayer. So these are what I call interactive prayer walks or praying uh, in your closets where there's um, spiritual equipping going on. You pray into this and let Jesus show you things. You know, uh, there's a psalm that says, equip my hands for war. Um, and, and oftentimes I would walk away for, from interactions feeling like they said something and I had no idea, like I didn't know what to do or say at that point. And the enemy will try to make, make it woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, and, and condemnation. But what I found is actually, if you just kind of step into that, the Holy Spirit will actually show you where he could have taken the next step um, to equip you so that the next time you encounter that, you're more prepared, right? He's not expecting you to go from zero to 50. They walked for, with Jesus for three and a half years. And I was just telling a buddy of mine, Honestly, I think Jesus' whole ministry pretty much went up in smoke, except for the 12, you know, or the 200 that were in that upper room. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to show for it at the end, um, except a lot of seeds planted and a few blue-collar yahoos that smelled like fish that were ready to lay their lives down. Um, and so when Pentecost happened, boom, it seemed to kind of start there, honestly, um, and I'm sure that there were a lot of people who had already heard about Jesus. And so, you know, just take that with a grain of salt. I'm not trying to be technical. Um, anyway, so one is learn to enter into people's lives by noticing people around you um, and then respond in love. Sometimes you, you'll notice something and it won't be something that you say, but you'll actually see a way to serve, right? Some of you will be you'll see an opportunity to do something practical. Uh, lawns that aren't getting cut in your neighborhood, you know, maybe, uh, or shopping carts that are just about empty that, hey, I, you know, I can take that back for me, for you, you know, and you, you know, it, you're not going to have a great long conversation necessarily. It's not out of manipulation. It's living with this kingdom open-heartedness as a lifestyle, but you'll find that, relationships with strangers form with people who are living in this love. Um, and then learn to learn to listen. And this is one thing that I would really encourage believers. Sometimes we have so much pressure on ourselves to speak and communicate the gospel that we don't do a good job of relating with one another, much less sinners. Why? Because we've become terrible listeners. Um, you've been around people that you can tell are only listening to find things wrong with what you say. You, you shut down. You know, that there's no way that this is relationship is going forward. Listen, Romans 14, 1 says, accept those that are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on their opinions. Right? Don't just accept people that have, you know, different convictions than you so that you can accept them into a relationship so that you can get them to open up and really start to share. And then now well, I'm slamming you for all your opinions. That's it over with, you know, nobody likes to talk to people who are judging them for their opinions. Um, and so you need to learn to be a gracious person around you um, and to be able to look for what you have in common, look for a starting point that's positive not parental. What I mean is this, is that the world is sick of Christians saying, 
Oh, you shouldn't do that. That's a no, no, right? They don't need, they don't need you parenting them. They need you revealing Jesus. Amen. Sinners felt comfortable. They were drawn to Jesus. They were restored and built up by, by him. Uh, it wasn't because he was going around compromising his convictions, nor was he going around parenting them and saying, oh, that's a no-no, right? There's a middle ground here that's a kingdom ground that redeems people, that meets them where they're at, that helps uh, affirm them, but then take them further. Remember, he started with Nathaniel, behold, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He could have called him out for some secret sin. Believe me, Nathaniel had them. Amen. But he started by, by affirming where God was at work in his life to take him further and to begin to reveal what he wanted to do in his life. Uh, remember Peter? You know, first thing he did with Peter, you're a rock. Amen. Peter was not a rock yet. <laughs> Believe me, he wasn't even a rocket scientist. You know, he was, he was maybe a uh, you know, is, is hard headed as a rock, but Jesus affirmed something valuable in Peter right away to build that relationship. So learn to enter into people's lives um, by noticing, by loving, by listening, by being a good listener, um, and, uh, and by being a blesser. Amen. He's called you to build a relationship that's positive, that's encouraging, that's, a, that's bringing blessing into people's lives. There's some things you can't bless, right? You can't, you know, you really beat your wife really good. You know, <laughs> your arms are so strong. I can tell by, you know, her missing teeth and her black eyes. You don't want to bless that. That's craziness, right? You can't bless that. Um, uh, but there's some things you can bless. Here's uh, here's another thing. When you're listening, you're not just asking them questions uh, willy-nilly. Uh, there's levels of questions, right? Uh, so uh, think of it this way. There's friendly interaction. That's the surface level interaction. Hey, nice weather today. I like your shirt. Uh, you know, what's your name? Blah, blah, blah. That kind of stuff. Friendly interactions. Then there's personal interactions. That's the next level down, right? Uh, that's the, are you sure you're okay? What's, something seems to be bothering you. You know, this gets a little bit more personal. Or, you know, what made you choose this job? Is this where you want to stay? You know, like, the, like getting to know someone, their life, their values, what makes them tick, um, their frustrations, their challenges, their dreams, their ambitions. The, so you, from friendly to personal. Per, friendly conversations lead to personal conversations. Personal conversations lead to spiritual conversations, right? Um, so how does God fit into this for you? Does he? What was your, what was your religious background? You know, and at that point, sometimes don't mistake the fact that people have bad attitudes towards religion, the church, or Christianity for being a closed door. Oh, they're not open. No, they're not open to self-righteous, judgmentalistic pricks telling, using the Bible to make them feel condemned. Um, they're probably more open to Jesus than you realize, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, at that point, you may need to unpack some of, of their experience. So sometimes it's learning to say, you know, oh, man, I hate Christians, right? I remember having an interaction with a guy one time at a grocery store. Um, and I noticed he had a, a t-shirt that had a silver cross on it. I said, Oh, I noticed you have a silver cross on your t-shirt. Are you a Christian? You know, he goes explicit, explicit. No, man, I ate, I hate explicit Christians. Right. You know, I don't know if there's a beat button on here, but I'm not going to say it anyway. So he was just using all kinds of foul languages language. And I said, I said, really, how come? And I wasn't defensive. I don't feel the need to be defensive about people, um, people's attitudes. If you've got to learn to listen without feeling like you have to win an argument, it's not an us versus they conversation. Listen, try to understand people where they're coming from. Maybe they believe something different. 
Uh, maybe they're Muslim or New Age, or maybe they have a hodgepodge of convictions. You know, I have my own spirituality. I said, oh, man, that's interesting. Tell me about it. I want to know. And I'm not trying to judge them. I'm like, how did you get interested in this? Like, where, what have been your sources? Um, you know, how is it making a difference in your life? What questions are you still asking? You know, those are, those are questions that are worth asking, not because I'm trying to uh, look for an open door for me to launch into a monologue. That's where, where a lot of believers um, go astray because they stop listening. Listen, James, there's some, there's some verses we need to hold in tension. In James, it says, let everyone be quick to listen slow to speak, slow to become angry. And let's get behind that a little bit. Why? Because being slow to listen, quick, uh, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, it's a good way of relating to people. It's an other-centered. It's loving others as you would want to be loved. It's showing an interest in other people, saying, you know what, I'm interested in your perspective. Not that I'm going to buy into it, right? The more secure you are in your own convictions, the more open-hearted you can be, right? I'm not worried about people leading me astray. Um, and so that's a really good thing. You can listen more open-heartedly. You don't have to walk around with your, you know, your, your guard up all the time in interactions. Um, and you got to get used to that because honestly, these days, people um, are looking, are, how you relate to them communicates as much to them as what you say, anything you say. And so if you um, launch into monologues uh, and just hog the floor, they've, they check out. They'll let you finish, but they check out. They're not going to pursue this relationship. Why? You don't seem like somebody who is a respectful person. And they don't want to become disrespectful. All right. So that we need to hold, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak in tension with let your speech always be seasoned with grace and make the most of every opportunity so that you may know how to respond to each one. Right. So the most of every opportunity, that means that the opportunities are going to be different from person to person. It, you and unless you're really paying attention and being out there with your speech season with grace, you can't just take a one size fits all approach to every person. The most of this opportunity might look different than the most of another opportunity. And part of our problem is that we've been trying to push everything uh, to the end at every time. And it's a very crude, crass example. But, you know, if you've been used to scoring on your first date most of the time, uh, and then you meet a young lady that puts up the barriers, but you don't respond to that, you commit date rape. And it's not a good thing, right? And there's people who I think honestly have felt violated by the way in which Christians have interacted with them, with the gospel. So it's very important that we interact with people humbly um, and that we don't just blow past the yellow lights and red lights that people put up and, and build those relationships. Let me share, share with you how this has been impacting me personally. One of the things that was interesting is that I've, as I've been paying more attention to this, I've realized that I had some self-fulfilling prophecies in my mind that were driving me to, um, to do the very thing I'm now advocating that we don't, right? Um, it, meaning that I would begin to feel sometimes like, um, you know, this might be the last time I have a chance to interact with them, so I might as well just go ahead and get everything out. What I've done, though, is create a self-fulfilling prophecy because by by continuing on, even after I can tell they're becoming uncomfortable with, with the conversation, I'm guaranteeing it will be the last time that I interact with them. Uh, you, you see what I mean? So what, what's been interesting now is you realize Jesus actually called them to enter into homes to eat with them as the foundation of doing ministry in their home. Heal the sick, then preach the kingdom. That's in verse 9, after verse 7. 
of, of entering into people's homes and eating with them. What happens when you eat with people? You form a relationship. You have conversation. You interact. Um, and this is the neat thing is because in, in evangelizing in this way, you're actually positioning yourself to disciple people to faith in the context of a, of a relationship that isn't a once and done thing so that when they come to faith, you're already connected with them to disciple them to become a reproducing, strong, mature Christian that doesn't, and they'll follow your example and, and they won't become a salesman. They'll actually take the same example that you interacted with them uh, 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 for. And so those are, those are some of the neat things. And now with that as a background, what's cool is go back and read the Gospel of Luke and you will see how Jesus entered into people's homes over and over and over. He did so much of his ministry by making friends and entering into people's lives to eat with them, making friends, entering into people's lives to meet with them. And homes were very often the, the, uh, a strong place of ministry. He ministered in synagogues, ministered in homes, ministered in the marketplace. It's all a valid place to carry Jesus. But I, but I think Pastor Pete would agree with me to say, that it's not the strategy it's not a good strategy to say we're going to just invite all of madison to the church and that's going to be how they're going to be reached it's going to be christians who re who embrace one another who seek god in prayer and get his vision and get his heart and begin to very simply connect with the world around them and bring the kingdom into people's lives um, not just by talking about jesus but by loving people like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Yeah, that was fantastic, Andy. Um, you know, just really struck listening to parts of that about how in a lot of ways we've had a concept of evangelism that's a bit like telemarketing um, and 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 then and then of course no one is interested and then you go down all those negative paths that you just talked about and uh, i think you know we've we've worked at destiny uh both knowingly and unknowingly over the years to create a a family uh and a place of belonging and i think what you're describing is evangelism and discipleship, how it would work best within the foundation that we already have laid. So yeah. I, I really think you've really uh, articulated that exceptionally well that, that it wouldn't, because sometimes I've seen church models where it's kind of like the, the evangelism style is, completely opposite to the church culture and right. so you have kind of like you know it'd be like you have alpha discussion groups and then sundays is turn or burn or you'd have like you know preaching with a bullhorn on a street corner and then you have a seeker sensitive church model. I mean, it's kind of like this is this is total disconnect and i think that you know what you're describing is is evangelism that is highly relational and I think that's that whole component about how we treat each other and how we treat other people is even more ratcheted up right now because yeah. we've never been more um, divided culturally than we are right now in this moment. And, and to be able to, you know, to do better, than our culture in terms of relating to each other, even, you know, that to, to just have a capacity to agree to disagree about things is seems to have been so diminished culturally that even for people to say, well, okay, you totally don't agree with that person, but you still love them, um, yeah. will be an incredibly powerful witness right now. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's, that's so good. And, and, uh, just to invite people in you know this you know, this also makes it um the um 
that the people who have felt kind of socially awkward that have found a place of acceptance in the church actually become part of the community witness that maybe they have a difficult time uh, to feel like, well, I, I, find, I find it hard to make friends just in general. Um, uh, but in the church, I found a place of acceptance. Well, it's interesting because if, if you um, hook up with a, 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 a small team to say, hey, like, for example, we're going to go and we're going to jump into this Barnes and Nobles book club or be part of a bowling team or whatever. Right. They still have that place of acceptance. And what's neat is that the love that Jesus has formed between in his body helps people who may actually feel like, my goodness, you know, if they'll accept them, maybe they'll accept me. Right, if they right, value right. them, maybe they'll value me. So, so the, um, it, it's really, everybody has a place and is part of the music or the words or both of this song that God is uh, singing right. in our uh, world. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Again, I think there's been a, a a church model that you're, you know, the objective is to be cool, right? And 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 instead of you know we're a family, and it doesn't matter whether you're cool or not. Um, and I think I, I do. I think there's been a, there's been a huge push in that direction, and so oh, exactly. so it's so important. Because uh, and there's usually only like two cool churches in a city right. Right, you know, right, right. because like as soon as the you know the cool church becomes you know every oh that's the cool place and so the carnal <laughs> believers just gravitate right. towards right. that yeah um, because they want to be associated with cool well what happens but they leave parts of christianity that are so uncool out and that's right. where a lot of heresies yeah. are being generated these days right, right. churches because right. You know, hell's not cool. Uh, holiness yeah. is not cool. Right. Um, but those things are are really important as well. Yes. And so it's about the kingdom. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 No, then, I... then you get into all the lordship issues because you haven't dealt with the uncool things. Right. So, yeah. 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 No, that's, um, that's, that's, so that's to that's have good. a have a place of of acceptance and value that's based on Jesus and not your performance is a perfect place for people to um, heal and be transformed as they encounter the truth, because the truth is valued, Jesus is valued, and you are valued. Um, and so while you're still dealing, like, it's amazing. I don't think I've met anybody who's married anymore. I mean, they just, everybody lives together and raises kids together. Okay. So do I make that the first issue or maybe I just make Jesus the issue and yeah. help uh, and help have a relationship that's strong enough that when that comes up, they know I value them because I've, I've walked with them now for six months right. and I've known that they live this way. It's not like that was an issue for me yeah. to accept them. Right. Um, right. Is it God's best? Not God's best. Um, but they're going to have to make those changes and they need somebody to walk with them as they make those changes, not somebody who's going to condemn them until they make the change. Totally. Right. Different. Yeah. And, and, and also Andy, uh, you know, people are observing you and your wife, Tina and your yeah. marriage, and actually it will provoke them to jealousy Mm. to want that so you know uh, i would be it, jealous it, living it out looking at me and, and the wife i've got man I... <laughs> <laughs> Done yeah. Good. yeah no that's so that'll good, make you that. believe in grace right there <laughs> yeah hey I, i've I, she's great i've I've, li I've, I've listened to how she introduces you on your podcast <laughs> she takes no prisoners i love it so I, I, th I think I think the other thing um, I wanted to comment on quick, and then have you pray for us and 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 uh, and a release more of that over us that you carry. And it was, you know, it's also been striking to me when when I think about those chapters in Luke you were just talking about. You know that that, that Luke chapter ten about sending out the seventy. Um, 
you know, the, the very last thing before that in Luke chapter nine, there are the three guys who come and have those conversations about following Jesus and they don't actually do it. And, right. and, and, and the, the, the heading in, 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 in uh, the ESV and I think in other translations is, you know, the cost of following Jesus. And I like to think about chapter 10 as illustrating the cost of not following Jesus, right? Because those three guys probably would have been in that group of 72 that had come back with all those cool stories and testimonies, but they all came up with reasons why they couldn't do it. And so I kind of imagine in my head, them running into someone else who said yes, and then going, man, you missed it. You should have seen it. It was so cool. Yeah. This happened and that happened. And they're, they're kind of like, crud. <laughs> I don't want to miss out next time. <laughs> so I think, you know, we, we, we need to keep the, the, the tension there as well about, yeah, there's a cost to some of this. It won't always be comfortable. It, you know, people might say some mean things to you, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's a cost of not doing it too, which is, you know, often that we stagnate, you know, that we don't have testimony, that, 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 that we're not, uh, you know, feeling like we lack purpose, you know, on and on and on. And um, there's that side of the, the equation as well, isn't there? So anyway. Yeah, 100%. That's very well said. Um, you know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, the workers are few. Um, but it's not because Jesus has excluded us and it's important to understand whatever, whenever anyone made excuses, Jesus never bought into them. So right now, um, there is absolutely no reason that Jesus will accept to not be involved in his mission from any one of us. Um, He's compassionate. He's not going to um, extinguish a dimly burning wick. He, he right. will fan you into flame. He will meet you where you're at. But he says, follow me. I will make you a fisher of men. We don't get to invent a different sort of following Jesus that we say, I'll follow you, but you're not allowed to make me a fisher of men. Right. That is not New Testament kingdom Christianity. Um, and so, you know, an attractional model of church, one of the challenges of being a pastor and, and, and having integrity in this is that you know that the cool church down the street does not push people to evangelism. Um, uh, and, and the temptation is for the people in the congregation to look for what's easy, to look for what's comfortable what makes them feel emotionally, um, you know, it's just all I, you know, the expectations are low. And so I would encourage each one who's listening to be honest with themselves and to say, you know, I, I really, I, I need to obey Jesus in this. I need to, and, and whatever changes need to be made to bring my life into order so that that becomes practically um, uh, lived out. Yeah. That as I set my heart towards that, that the changes that the Lord makes are part of my sanctification and part of my discipleship. It doesn't, it didn't just happen, you know, you know, great. You said you follow me, you pray this prayer, great. You're a fisherman, boom. You know, it didn't, yeah. you know, there was a process involved. The Lord recognizes that process. But from the beginning, there's a yes, Jesus, I will follow you with the understanding your vision for me is that I live um, as an ambassador of your mission, as a disciple maker, and I am willing, I'm all in on this training thing. So yeah. do with me what you will. And, you know, there's experienced disciple makers in your body. I know that. I know Sherry to be that. Um, I know Pastor Pete and, and Pastor Allie. Um, they're called to equip the saints. And so, you know, each of you can look around and say, okay, maybe your response is, I say, yes, I need some help. Great. Find somebody. (laughs) Look around, find somebody and say, please help me. I want to, I want to grow in this. Um, And don't make it all about you. Yeah. You're going to have to grow in personal life, but man, you grow as you serve. (laughs) And sometimes, um, you know, 
the best uh, growth takes place when you just decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to forget about me and my problems and I'm going to go out and love some other people right now. Um, Cause Jesus does an amazing work just to get us to that place. So, yes, absolutely. Would you pray for us, Andy? Absolutely. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless my brothers and sisters. I thank you right now for the work um, that you're doing in each one's heart. God, I thank you right now for protecting this word from any condemnation. Lord, I thank you that you give grace, you give life, you give help, and you empower us. And I thank you, God, that even if it seems like there's a long distance between where we are now uh, and what we feel capable of versus what this message contains about your vision and your heart, Lord, we just say, yes, Lord, you can do it. You give us the Holy Spirit to empower us to be your witnesses. It's supernatural for us to be your witnesses. We cannot do it apart from you. We just agree, but we will not be discouraged. We thank you for the promise of the Father that has been given to us and won by you, Lord Jesus. And so we, we receive a fresh infilling in Jesus' name of your Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, fill us afresh, empower us with your, with your, uh, with your heart, with your fire, mm-hmm. that we might be carriers of your fire. And it's not about us. It's about the, the presence of the Lord. It's about the, the finished work that you have accomplished, Jesus. You have won the victory to set us free. And so get our eyes off of ourselves and fill us with your heart and your vision for the people around us. In Jesus' name, amen.